that old person that was incompatible with God that man was killed on the cross the reality of the fact in Christianity is we are born of the spirit but we are discipled by the word understand that there is a capacity that is called the nature of God that is in you Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 where the bible talks about uh the gospel of christ the bible says for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ and i said thank god they have not said it uh, they have not uh, put it as a gospel of god because that can confuse a few people because they would think uh, that the old testament is also considered as the gospel amen uh the bible continues to say for it is the power of god to salvation for everyone who believes for the jew first and also for the greek so it is the power of god for everyone who believes so when you look at the word believe depending on the context we believe the word okay but believe is a verb believe is a is a verb it is a doing word so you do not you cannot call yourself a believer if you do not do okay so believers are doers believers are doers of the word of god so first we believe the gospel the gospel now makes us believers when you become believers we are not just there saying that we are believing because you're already a believer how many believe in jesus you are a believer so right now what god expects for you to do is to do something with what you have believed so believers are doers the believe uh, believe is a is a verb it is a doing it is a doing word so if you're not doing anything then really you're not uh, living out what you call yourself to be and that is a believer so we said last sunday that the gospel of christ is the power of god to salvation and not for salvation i am saying this for the sake of those who are not with us last sunday not for salvation to salvation meaning it is a gospel is a power of god to a place to a reality that is called salvation and when i said when we uh, spoke about salvation we said that this salvation is esoteria okay that the full package of salvation okay is a full package of salvation not just the initial conversion from being a sinner to becoming a saint okay not just the initial conversion so the bible to is, has told us that the bar the, the the gospel of christ and i'm gonna emphasize this because if you do not get it here you might not be able to understand where we are going today okay so the gospel of jesus christ is a power of god to salvation so we looked at it what is the content of this power we tried to define this power because we say this power is not a force we say there are those that we call the power gifts you know the healing the working of miracles those are called power gifts but god here he's saying that the gospel the understanding of the gospel of jesus christ the package of the gospel of jesus christ is a power of god to a place to a reality that is called salvation and that is what uh, we took time to define last sunday so it's important church of jesus christ for you to understand what is it when we talk about uh, the gospel of jesus christ we there, you have to define it right so what is the gospel of jesus christ the gospel of jesus christ is what god has done for you in christ jesus amen what god has done for you in christ jesus and this is the aspect of the legality of salvation this is a justification are you understanding this is a reconciliation this is the adoption 
You can never do anything to be more justified. You can never do anything to be more righteous. Okay? There is nothing that you could ever do to be more reconciled to God. So these are realities that happened 2,000 years ago. And there is nothing you can ever do to change that. Amen. You can never work to be more righteous. You're already righteous because righteousness is a gift that God has given us in Christ. You can never be more just. You're already justified. Amen. You can never be more that. So when you're talking about understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is in two, uh, in, is it, uh, it is in two places or in two definitions, but in one. It is what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. And that is what I have just told you. And we did not participate in that. Amen. You did not do anything to become righteous. You just needed to believe. Okay. You did not do anything to become justified. You just needed to believe. You did not do anything for you to be reconciled back to God. You just needed to believe, to be adopted into the family of God, there was no effort on your side. You just needed to believe. Amen. And now after you have come to understand that, then you ask yourself, what is it that God is doing in me through the person of the Holy Spirit and the word of God? This is where now needs your participation. What is God doing? Because this one cannot happen. You cannot be able to enjoy this aspect of salvation without you cooperating together with God. So in, in, uh, in a nutshell, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what God has done for you in Christ. Amen. And what God is also doing through you, through his word and the person of the Holy Spirit. That comprises the definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you can be able to understand what happened from the cross to the resurrection, you have understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So it is what God has done for us and what the Holy Spirit and the word of God is doing in us. What is the definition of this? Power. How do you define? Because if you were to define me, you cannot define me without defining my personality. There is so much that makes, makes uh, up to me. Are you understanding? So you cannot say that you know me if you do not understand what I like. You cannot say you know me if you do not understand my personality. I mean, there is so much that makes up Pauline. Are you understanding? So the same thing when you're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ being the power of God. So what we were doing last Sunday, we were breaking up. We were breaking down. We opened up, you know, because the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ is also called the gospel of grace. And it also means love gifts. Okay. So last Sunday we were unpacking the love gifts. Okay. And those love gifts is what came out as love. Okay, well, those love gifts is what came out as a, as a peace. Those love gifts is what came out as kindness, long suffering, joy. Those are the love gifts that comprise the what God uh, describes as the power of the gospel. Are you understanding? All that is what God comprises, that what God defines as a power of the gospel. So give me Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. And I forgot to send you notes. It is well. You move with the speed of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. You didn't come for the notes. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to verse 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love amen may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of god which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of god so meaning that uh the more you know the love of God. And we said last Sunday that when you are talking about uh, peace, joy, those are different expressions of God's love. Okay? Those are different expressions of, of God's love. So, 
peace is, a, is an expression of God's love. Joy is an expression of God's love. Long suffering is an expression of God's love. Righteousness, truth, faith, those are expressions of God's love. So we say the basis of everything that God has given us is love. But love has its own diverse expressions. And these are the expressions that make up, amen, that make up the gospel of Jesus Christ being defined as a power of God, as a power of God. So here the Bible is telling us, mm, I, I really would have uh, wanted it, uh, uh, give it back to us in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 19, that Christ may dwell in your, to know the love of Christ, which I love you so much. <laughs> to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of, so you may be. Are you understanding? You may be filled. Meaning, there is something that you do so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The expression aspect of the fullness of God, okay? And how, how does that happen when you get to know the love of God? So the Bible is telling us that the love of God has a height, has a depth. You know, I, I always wondered, Lord, like, Lord, show me how is this depth like, you know? How is this heart, height like? I mean, how is the width of the love of God? How is it like? And when I was studying the word of God, this is what the Holy Spirit put in my heart and it uh, answered a question that I've always had. I have made confessions, but now the Bible is telling us that I will be able to comprehend, to be able to understand with all the saints, the width, the length, and the depth, and the height of the love of God. So it is so simple, and it's amazing. The simple things are so in front of us, that's why we miss them. So what I have always been telling you, okay, this, the content of the gospel is the width, the height, the depth of the love of God. Because it, whatever God has given us, should be something that becomes easy for us to access. God is not complicated. Whatever he has given us, he would want you to enjoy. But you cannot be able to enjoy what you don't understand. So when you're talking about the height, the depth, the length of the love of God, we are talking about the love of God in its different manifestations. When you get to know and comprehend the love of God in its different manifestations, like I have taught you, the Bible says, now you become filled with the fullness of God. Means the attributes of God now begins to become a reality in your life. That everything that God is, because God is gentle, God is kind, God is righteous, amen. God is the author of peace, God is love. When you begin to comprehend that, the Bible is saying that you begin to be filled, amen. You are filled with the fullness of God. So if you are walking in love, if you are walking in love but you're not enjoying peace, you're still and you have not enjoyed the fullness of God. If you are walking in patience, but you are not gentle, you are not enjoying the fullness of God. So that you enjoy the fullness of God when all these realities become your realities and you begin to not only know them, but you also experience them and express them to others. Because when you're full of something, you dispense. When you're full of something, you dispense. So when you get to understand this, you become full with it, filled with all the fullness of God because of that. Message. Okay, I have Jesus. I have received him. So what does it mean, the fullness of God, yet I have Jesus? It is these diverse expressions that now that make me filled with the fullness of God. God. So it should be your desire because there is nothing that God has given us that he would not want us to enjoy. So all this that I have said, God desires for you to enjoy them. And if you are able to enjoy all of them because they are gifts, you don't work for them. 
Okay? You do not work for them. These gifts, when you acknowledge them, they come by acknowledgement because you have not worked for them. You acknowledge I have the peace of God. You acknowledge I have the kindness of God. I have the gentle, I, I, I have the, the, the gentleness that comes from the Holy Spirit. I have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You make your faith effective as you begin to acknowledge the good things that are in you. Amen. The good things that are in you. When you begin to do that, then you begin to enjoy this reality. So I thought that was very, very important for us to be able to understand before you can, we can be able to get on what you want to talk about. So we said last time that this, oh, please understand this church. It's going to change your life. Okay. Once you understand the package. So when I say the package, you have already understood what I mean. When you begin to understand the package, the Bible says that this package becomes the power of God to salvation. Okay? Becomes the power of God to salvation. When you're talking about salvation, uh, of course we understand about its completeness, but let me just break it down for somebody to be able to understand. It is a deliverance from sin because you have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and the sin and its consequences. Okay, so it is deliverance from sin and its consequences. What are the consequences of sin? Poverty is a consequence of sin. Sickness is a consequence of sin because that is why when you encounter sickness, you rebuke it because it's a consequence of sin. So death is also a consequence of sin. That is why when believers die, as we don't die, the Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So as we do not, believers do not die. We just change locations. Okay. So and you are talking about salvation. This is what we are going to look at today. This salvation that the power of God leads us to. How is it that you are able to enjoy it? Okay. So it is very important for us, first and foremost, when you consider this box. Okay. When you consider this box, this box describes to you what Christ has already done. Such. Are you getting it describes to you what Christ, because that is, we said, that is the expl explanation of what the gospel is. What Christ has done for you, in Christ, what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So when he went on that cross, he did it for you. Okay. He did it for you. So the Bible is telling us now that we are in Christ, now that uh, we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into God's dear son, we also cannot overlook the fact that we are living on the earth. We are living on the earth. And this is where the second part of the description of the gospel of Jesus Christ begins to be applied. Not, of course, what Christ has done for us, amen, in Christ Jesus now becomes our foundation. It becomes our launching pad. But now what God is doing in us through his word and through the Holy Spirit is what we take advantage of to be able to enjoy the purpose for which the first part of salvation was done for us 2,000 years ago. Are you getting me? Hallelujah. So well, but now you have to come to a place as a body of Jesus Christ, as a body of Christ, to understand what is your position now? Where are you placed? Now that Jesus did what he did, what is your position? And can I tell you, church, there is nothing that God and Jesus will ever do about the devil now. Whatever he did 2,000 years ago was so conclusive that he's seated. So right now, there is nothing that God is doing about the devil. I'm sorry. So please, 
Don't be saying, God, I can't. God, come and help me rebuke the devil. <laughs> he will not do anything. Because whatever he did 2,000 years ago was conclusive. Okay? And there is nothing that God is doing right now as far as the devil is concerned. The next time that God will do anything with the devil is in Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 to verse 3. Can you imagine? For 2,000 years ago, we don't know for how long. Then I saw an angel. Don't, not even God. Okay. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit. So this is the, uh, this is the next time, church, that there's going to be an activity in heaven as far as the devil is concerned. Between 2,000 years ago and this time, the power, the authority has been given to the church. So please don't, don't bother God because he won't move. Don't think that you have said it, in, you have said it, now you are thinking you need an angel. No. The authority to deal with the devil has been given to us. Amen. So God is not doing anything as far as the devil is concerned. If you see the devil working against you, it is your responsibility to do something about that situation. It's your responsibility. Amen. So we, today, we are talking about that power of God to the place that is called salvation. And we said, when you're talking about salvation, it means that you're enjoying every, all the realities that Jesus died for you to enjoy. But remember, there's an enemy who does not want you to enjoy. So the authority is, is for this one, okay? That is trying to contradict, that is trying to hinder what God desires for you to enjoy because of what he did for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So today we are looking at the authority of the believer. The authority of the believer or our authority in Christ Jesus. Amen. So you can be a very wonderful Christian, loving Jesus, heaven bound, but still not be able to enjoy the realities of salvation here on the earth. Because authority has been given to us to make sure that we, what we read in the word of God becomes our personal experience. Amen. Becomes our personal experience. So authority, for it to be authority, has to be exercised. It has to be exercised. James chapter 1 verse 22 to verse 25. James chapter 1 verse 22 to verse 25. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves uh -huh. continue for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is a, like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was so what is the word of god telling us that we have to come from a place of just listening. Amen. When you, you listen to the word of God, when you get to understand the word of God, what, what makes it become a reality in your life, to a place where you can be able to touch, you can be able to enjoy what the Bible is talking about, is when you just stop being a hearer and become a doer of the word of God. Be a doer of the word of God. Don't just be a hearer. And it is in the doing of the word that we exercise our authority. 
Because as we do as we do the word of God and we find an obstacle on the way, we know what we are supposed to do. We exercise our authority and we get the obstacle out of the way so that we can be able to enjoy our benefits in Christ Jesus. Is somebody getting me? So authority is very important for us to be able to understand. And this authority that I am talking about is delegated power. Amen. Authority is delegated power. Okay? It is delegated power. So the Bible is telling us in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Okay? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So when it comes to the realities of who we are in the spirit, our position in Christ, there is no resistance. We already know who we are, okay? But here on the earth, there is one that wants to resist us. There is the one that does not want you to prosper. There is the one that does not want you to enjoy your marriage. There is one that does not want you to enjoy your health. There is the one that does not want you to enjoy your life to the full according to how God desired for you to live. Praise the name of Jesus. So when you're talking about resisting, this, this uh, pulpit is not resisting me. It is not. But resistance comes when there is an external force that is trying to push me. Amen. Submit yourself to the word. Amen. Submit yourself to the definition of the power. Are you getting me, church? The, uh, submit yourself to the definition of the power. Once you have submitted yourself and you know who you are, Amen. When you know who you are because you have submitted yourself to God. When I'm talking about submitting yourself to God, I mean that you are submitting yourself to the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you submit yourself to the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the Bible says that you resist the devil because you're not resisting him telling shetani talker, shetani talker. No, because you already know who you are. Amen. And let me tell you, authority you don't have to shout because the devil knows those who know their authority and those who do not jesus i know paul i know who are you he knows those who know amen you can you can lie to me but you can never lie to the spirit world the devil recognizes and he knows those who know. Amen. He knows those who know. So the Bible is saying once you have submitted yourself to the reality of the word of God, the Bible says then resist the devil. When you resist him, he does not die. The only thing he does is flee. Amen. He does not die, but he flees and you begin to enjoy that aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when he comes, he, he comes against you and he's trying to touch your health. The Bible says, resist him. How do you resist him? You have already submitted yourself to God. You know who you are and you know the word. Amen. But when he tries to come against you, you don't shout at him. You don't shout Sometimes we shout because we are Amen. We are angry at him. That is why we raise our voice. But whether you raise your voice or not, he still understands authority. But it's because we are so angry at what he's doing, that is why we cast him out with a lot of force. Because we have come to understand who we are in Christ. So when he comes to try and affect your health, you begin to resist and you tell him, Satan, I know who I am. I am born of God. I am born of the spirit of the living God. And my Bible just told me that this body has been purchased by the blood of God. And I live in this body and because I live in this body I am the one who is going to determine the environment within which I live because I am a spirit being and I have a body this body that I live in I am the one who is going to determine the kind of an environment I'm going to live in and in the name of Jesus I command you to get out of my kidneys in the name of Jesus Christ and in the name of Jesus I command you to let my heart pump blood how it is supposed to pump blood in the name of Jesus Christ God is not doing it 
He has given you authority to do it. He says, take your authority. You have submitted yourself to me. Take authority. So, I'm sorry church, but those who have not submitted do not have authority. Hey, praise God. So don't think you can live anyhow. Praise God. You cannot submit yourself to the devil and then tomorrow you are rebuking me. It's like, see, let's get serious. So you were with you yesterday. So what gives you authority to cast me out? So you cannot submit yourself to the devil and then tomorrow when you get sick, you are saying, I rebuke you. The devil says, ah, please. This cannot happen. So you first have to Submit yourself to God and then that gives you the authority to resist the devil. Gives you the authority to resist the devil. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, do I refuse for you to be sick. And if there be any sick person in this congregation, I rebuke that sickness in the name of Jesus and I declare that you receive your healing in Jesus' name. And somebody said, Amen. 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 So uh, the purpose for us exercising our authority is for us to be able to enjoy our dominion. The purpose for authority is, is dominion, is dominion. So that is very, very important for you to understand that the reason as to why God has given us authorities is so that we can be able to have dominion over the kingdom of the enemy and we can be able to enjoy our realities in Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 to, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse from verse 13 let's read the Bible says and you being dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh he has made alive together with him having forgiven all your trespasses having wiped out the, the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross having disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle over them triumphing over them in it amen so when paul was writing this he was not really uh purely writing it to the jews okay but the people that he was writing to are people who understood war okay are people who understood war and especially the roman kind of war okay so that is why it was very easy for them to be able to understand so this is what would happen when the romans would go to war okay and uh, they won a fight, okay? They won a fight. They would kill everybody else, but come with the king. The one that has been intimidating their people. And then the whole city would stand on the streets. They would, the whole city would stand on the streets as this king that has always been a threat to them is paraded through the streets and that is this this is what they would do they would even parade the king even if he was dead so that the people can see that your threat is gone forever okay so when the king they would really love to come with the king alive and this is what the 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 the, the romans would do they would take the king and cut both his thumbs Okay, so that he, they know this man will never hold a spear again. Because you cannot hold a spear with the four fingers. You need your, your thumb. So in the presence of the citizens, the two thumbs will be cut off. And then they would go, these guys were mean. Then they would go and cut the two toes. So that he cannot be able to wear shoes anymore. Okay, and then this person will be tied to a horse, will be tied to a chariot, and the whole city would be there to witness. As this man is being dragged in town, and everybody is cheering, 
and everybody is rejoicing that this one that was our threat now is defeated and defeated forever and this king would be dragged al along the streets until he dies out of bleeding and the whole city everybody now from that day would go back to their home knowing the one that was a threat will never be a threat to us anymore and that is why this church was able to understand what paul was talking about because when you look at the word of god yes there is a parade in the word of god of the defeat of the devil when you look at matthew you look at mark you look at the the, the gospel you look at uh, ephesians colossians i mean the defeat of jesus christ has been displayed in the word of god so that the church can get to a place and begin to celebrate that the one that was oppressed us before cannot be able to oppress us anymore and that is why the crucifixion of jesus christ was not done in secret so so that every person can look and see but the people that looked and saw they saw a sign a time of weakness for Jesus but in the spirit world it was a time of a triumphant possession yes this procession that was triumphant in the spirit when Jesus was crucified on that cross oh the Jews did not see what was happening in the spirit but what was happening in the spirit that the enemy of man was being conquered once and for all never to rise again yes there was that triumphant procession but in the spirit the people did not see it but the demons and the angels oh i believe the angels were clapping they were saying since adam oh across genesis exodus oh deuteronomy habakkuk we have never seen this but finally the enemy of man has finally been conquered never to arise again now man can arise and become what god desired for them to be since the book of genesis oh right now for the first time god has gotten back his sons oh not only sons but sons that can be able to wield their authority oh sons that can be able to exercise their dominion there was celebration in heaven as jesus was on that cross as he was going to hell oh the angels were like jews you do not understand what is happening that there is something happening in the spirit that the enemy of mankind has finally been defeated and this defeat is not for a season this defeat is an eternal defeat oh church of jesus christ bring it to your consciousness that what jesus did was not just for the jews what jesus did was also for us and it is still as powerful right now as it was on that hill of golgotha two thousand years ago today you can arise and faith and say you know what i refuse for the devil to put me down anymore i have come to understand that he is defeated and his defeat is eternal his defeat is eternal so even when we are we are praying we do not pray you see now when you are praying we do not pray with one we are not praying against with against one that is at our level please it's an insult to the cross for you to ever say one day that the devil is powerful because he's not but you're asking pastor how come people still get sick how come do you, do you still go to find some regions where they are worshiping the devil and uh, they, are, they, are, they are worshiping and there are some things that are happening that are contrary to the word of God? You know why? It's because when he was defeated, the second Adam, the second Adam gave back the dominion back to man. And now, for the devil to exercise any authority over a region, for the devil to exercise any authority over a city, he has to come and deceive men 
in that city. And when, when he deceives men or women in that city, without knowing, they are giving him their dominion for him to rule over them. That is why in, a, in, in some cultures where you find so much oppression of the enemy, they have rights, you know, R-I-T-E-S. They have sacrifices. You know, they have uh, offerings. They have sacrifices that they give to the devil. And as they are giving the devil those sacrifices, because they are not being forced, what they don't know is that they are giving their God-given dominion back to the devil. So the devil is not powerful. It is us who are the residents, the official and the legal residents of the earth. Spirits are not supposed to have dominion on the earth because the earth was given to man. The earth was given. So for the devil to come and have dominion on the earth, he has to get power from the owners of the earth. From the official and the legal residents of the earth. They have to give him dominion. That is why you go to a place and you're like, oh, they, they, they say in this territory there is this. If you go back, you'll discover there was a deception. And the people bowed to that deception. And that gave the devil authority over that area. But if you arise as a Christian, it doesn't matter the kind of a family that you are coming from. And you said they gave him dominion. But right now, I've not been born according to the will of, of, of man, but I have been born according to the will of God. And whatever authority my family gave to the devil, I refuse for the devil to wield his power over me because now I am a new creation. It ends with me because now I do not belong to uh, the devil has no authority over me because I am a child of God. What am I saying? I am trying to convince you how defeated the devil is. He is defeated. And his defeat has been paraded through scripture. If you look at the scripture, you are going to see that the devil has been the devil has been defeated. We are the ones, by the way, we are the ones that uh, we are the ones that give him authority. So, as a person, and you see now, uh, you are not responsible for me. I'm responsible for myself. Okay. And by the way, church, do you know you don't have power over somebody else's will? That is why Jesus would ask, "Do you what would you want me?" to do for you. He did not go healing anybody. As much as he was God, he healed those that were brought to him. Meaning, by the time you are coming, you have already agreed to the fact that there is somebody that is healing and I'm going to him to heal me. Are you understanding? But blind Bartimaeus, Jesus had to ask him, what do you want me to do for you? Are you getting me? So, even God has no power over your will. If he did, he would have had power over the will of Adam and Eve. And we would not be in the trouble we are as the earth. Because he would have forced them not to eat the fruit. But God does not have power over your will unless you allow him. And you do not have authority as a person over the will of another person. You don't have. Even when you want to cast out demons, when you want to heal the sick, you ask them, would you want me to pray for you? If they say yes, now they have given you authority and the leeway for you to be able to pray for them. Are you understanding? Yeah, you do not have authority over someone else's. You don't have, you, the only person that you have authority, like now, I have authority over my family. I have authority over my family. Devil, you don't go touching my family because God has given me authority over my family. But I don't have authority over your family unless you allow me to. But I have authority over my family. I can decide 
what will become of my children because God has given me that authority but I do not have authority over somebody else over their will but if you come to me and you say pastor this is what is happening in my life please pray pray for me or pray with me that way you have opened the door and you have told me pastor now you are allowed to participate in my issues you are allowed to participate in what is happening in my life so you cannot impose amen you cannot impose it you uh, over somebody else because you do not have authority over them has somebody just gotten that and that is why because you do not have authority over the will of another person that is where now the prayer of supplication comes you supplicate for them until the day they will respond to god because even to god they have to to respond positively to him for him to do anything in their lives that's why the prayer of supplication is a prayer that you can pray many times okay because i have prayed for this person but from what the look of things it seems that they have not allowed god to influence them so i'm going to pray for them again until they get to a place where they open their heart to the power of god to be able to change their lives so the prayer of supplication you pray until you see until you see results because you're not praying for yourself you're praying for somebody else who you do not have power over their will okay but now you can pray that that person can allow the word of god to influence them so that they can become the person that god desires for them to become so that is why we supplicate for other people until we see god working in their lives that's why we have the prayer of supplication have somebody gotten that yeah that is very very important so we are looking at our authority in christ somebody say authority what did i say authority is it is delegated the fact that it is delegated does not mean it is any less it is just delegated does not mean that it is any less but it is just delegated so we said we have have you understood this box okay but now we are in the world where now we have to exercise our authority so that the, this can become a reality in our personal lives what what i was showing you last sunday so the bible is telling us in the book of uh, first peter 5 6 to 9, 8 to 9 first peter chapter 5 verse 8 to 9 the bible says be sober he's speaking to people who are born again be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour resist him in, remember we talked about resistance resist him resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world so when we are talking about is the bible telling us be sober i mean this if the person is being told to be sober meaning before they were sober they were drunk of something there, there was something that affected their state of soberness are you understanding so the bible is saying be sober don't don't be double minded okay be sober and uh, uh, and soberness does not uh, it is not an issue of saying no i'm not going to think about anything no the word of god is the only truth is only the reality that brings soberness into your life because this soberness that i'm talking about is you getting out of the place of arguments not physical drunkardness okay so how how else can you be able to overcome arguments in your mind and you see soberness is not a state of the spirit it is a state of the mind okay it is a state of the mind so the bible is saying be sober overcome arguments by allowing the word of god okay to overcome those arguments okay to be able to overcome those arguments so the bible is saying uh uh, you you overcome because we have an adversary the devil by the way is on the earth 
He's not dead, but he's powerless. Okay? And he's a, a, a powerless adversary. So the Bible is telling us that the devil walks. I mean, you know the only thing that the devil has is time. He's waiting for the book of Revelation <laughs> to be tied by the chain and to be thrown. But before then, the only thing he has is, yes, he has time. Oh, what the only advantage he has is, so the Bible is saying that this devil, he walks about like a rolling lion. He's not one, but he looks like. He pretends to be, okay, a lion. And if you do not know the word, the devil will intimidate you. Because why did God use the, a lion and not a lizard? You see, who cares about a lizard? But man, you don't want to meet a lion. Even after you have come from Kesha. <laughs> Even after prayer, you don't want to meet a lion because a lion is very intimidating. Okay? So the Bible is talking about the intimidations of the enemy. So the Bible is saying that he comes trying to intimidate you. You understand? He comes and tries to intimidate you. And that is why the Bible tells you be sober. Because if you are not sober and you have arguments, well, it will be a confirmation that the devil is powerful. And you will be running and he will be chasing you. But now, when you are sober because of the word of God, you will stand and you will tell him, I know that I know that you might be intimidating, but you cannot intimidate me because I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You tell him, Satan, by the way, God has called me God. You are God's to whom the word of truth came. So you tell him, devil, I, I understand. I am so superior to you. I cannot come down to your level. But if you have arguments, you do not know the word of God, eh, he will intimidate you. You will wake up one day and uh, you are rubbing oil on your, and you find a, you feel there is something hard on your, on your hand. And uh, even before you cast it out, you are looking for your card, your insurance card to run to the doctor. Because he comes to intimidate. But when you know yourself, you first laugh and tell him, really? Of all the addresses, you chose mine. Of all the places you would have gone, you chose to come to my house. And then you lay your hand on that place because you are sober. You, you, are you getting? You are sober in your mind. This, this soberness is a, is a state of your emotions. It's a state of your mind because of how you have allowed the word of God to become one with you. So when you touch it, before you look for the insurance card, you, you hold it and rebuke him. And tell him, you know what? This body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. This body, this hand is a member of Christ. And you do not go touching members of Christ. And in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave my body. But can you imagine if he comes and finds somebody who is not sober? So allow the word of God to make you sober. We have come from somewhere. We have come from being taught Moses. But allow the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God, to make you sober. Know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That brings a, a, an aspect of soberness. And you know that you have the peace of God on your inside. And you know I have the faith of God. Not faith in God. That one is good in itself. But God has even made it better. He says, I have given you my faith. Deal with him. So that creates an aspect of soberness. When this adversary tries to come against you, comes to come against your business, you tell him, Satan, by the way, this is not like any other business. This is a kingdom business. I am a partner with God. And God knows how to take care of his partners. And Satan, you cannot touch a 
partner that as somebody that has partnered with God and I declare that you get out of my business and you begin to declare what you want to see in your business because one thing I tell you guys we don't kill the enemy he's always around but it's our aspect of being sober that helps us and the Bible is saying be sober be vigilant amen be sober and be be vigilant it means it's being vigilant means keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties so be vigilant as far as the deception of the enemy is concerned be vigilant be careful what you listen to don't say amen to everything don't agree with everything me there are times i watch somebody and i say no i know they can't hear me but i'm listening i say no that's not what the bible says are you getting me you say no because you are vigilant because you are careful you are watchful you are watchful against deception because the day you get you borrow deception the day you agree with deception is the day you empower the devil so you have to be very you have to be very vigilant that is why in this time and dispensation you have to be very careful what you see what you watch what you listen to you have to be very vigilant it doesn't matter it comes in the name of an archbishop left right handed archbishop or whoever i tell you if it is not the gospel of jesus christ i am vigilant and i say no you have to be vigilant for possible danger because the devil by the way will never have his full effect until you have agreed with him the same way God cannot work in your life by force, neither can the enemy. That's why the Bible is saying, be sober, be vigilant. So the Bible is saying, this devil is looking for whom he may devour. Meaning, it's not everybody he devours. There are those who devour, he devours. Those who are not sober and those who are not vigilant, but they are Christians. The devil doesn't have to seek for a sinner. They are his. Will the devil seek for a sinner? They are ready. But the ones that he goes seeking for are ignorant Christians. You know, those who say, you see this disease? It went to my uncle. It went to my auntie. This disease, me, I see it running in the family. What you don't know is those words are empowering the enemy. You are giving the devil material to work with. So, but somebody who is vigilant says, hey, it may have killed my auntie, but for me, no. It might, it might be running in their family, but right now, as far as spiritual issues are concerned, I am not connected to my family. I am born of God. And greater is he that is in me. Amen. By the way, God changes our family. You will go for Christmas. You will eat nyamachoma. You will eat everything. But if I was to look at it spiritually, I'm sorry. Because if you are still connected with that family, whatever has been running in that family should come to you. But because you are of God, whatever runs into that family gets to you and has no way of coming to you. So if you do not know, the devil comes and lies to you that whatever was running is there, it, can, it still has a possibility to come into your life. But when you are sober, when you are vigilant, you tell him, mm -mm, no, not me, because I am born of God. Amen. So you have to be, you have to be sober and you have to be vigilant you have to be vigilant because there is so much deception that is going on out there and i have always said deception ceases to be deception when you understand it is deception but you can be deceived for years without knowing but the day you realize that it is this deception that is the day it loses its power over your life Amen. And right now the devil does not have any new card. 
Uh-uh. The only card he does is deception. He doesn't have anything else. He has no power. But he has to deceive you to a place of agreement so that you can hand him over your power. Are you getting me? And when you hand him over your power, then he has authority over you until the day you wake up and say, hey, come and think of it. No, 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 Satan, I rebuke in the name of Jesus and I refuse to be, to be under your influence in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible tells us, uh, as I begin to conclude, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. We are still looking at our authority in Christ. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What is the power of his might? <laughs> Don't make me feel like I want to resign to be a pastor. After I taught you last Sunday. The power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his... Okay, and in the power of the gospel. Are you understanding? And in the, the reality of the gospel. Praise the name of Jesus. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Let me pause there. The rulers of the darkness of this age, church, have been empowered by men. Okay? Have been empowered because the earth was given to man. Okay, so like I said, if you go to a place and you, say, you see a certain kind of oppression, there are men in a certain generation that empowered the devil for that manifestation to happen. Are you getting me? Okay, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly. So if you do not understand the gospel, of Jesus Christ, this scripture can make you feel so defeated. You're like, okay, so me, my five foot me, is fighting with rulers. <laughs> Are you understanding? You can feel so defeated. Yani, my five foot, I think I'm on five foot. Eh? For, this is my five foot. The Bible is telling me the word of God. He's telling me that I'm fighting with rulers, 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 the major ones of the darkness of this against spiritual hosts. I'm, it didn't even end there. It continued with spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I wish, you're thinking, Paul, I wish you said that the, it's the angels that are fighting. But the Bible is telling us, my brethren, so I am part of the group of the brethren who are fighting against rulers and fighting against hosts. You see now, if you do not look at this scripture from the perspective of the finished work of the cross, you'll be defeated before you start. You'll be defeated before you start. But when you begin to look at it from the perspective of the finished work of the cross, you will be like these hosts, these rulers, it doesn't matter the hierarchy, it doesn't matter. These ones have not been empowered by God. They have been empowered by ignorant men. And I am not coming as an ignorant person. I am coming from the angle of truth. So it doesn't matter by what name it goes by. Always know that you have authority over them. Because you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And this host of wickedness, they are not at your level. They are not even under your feet. They are way below you. But you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, but you are seated in JCC Thicker Road on this Sunday of 2nd of April. But in the spirit, you are seated in the heavenly places. And the Bible 
continues even tells you on which side of God that you are seated. You are seated at the right hand of the most high God. And that is a side of authority. If you see a president and has somebody that is sitting on his right, it means that the person that he has given authority so when you are seated with christ it doesn't matter by what name they come with the name they come by just know i am addressing you yes at jcc thicker road but my from my spiritual position i am seated with christ in the heavenly places far above principalities far above powers so as you address the devil you do not address him thinking that he has the ability to come against you but what you allow in here is what makes the difference there are people who go to uh and this really disqualifies i'm sorry and i'm coming from there Amen. So we are all guilty, most of us. Most of us are guilty. We came from that place where in our head we saw a big devil. And when we were going for the Kesha, we were going for the Kesha to deal with this big, to deal with this big entity. And we would go, no wonder we never won. No wonder we never won. No wonder we'd say, I've been asking God and it is not happening. Because we did it wrong. Because we saw the devil as one that is stronger than us. So, can you imagine, instead of worshipping God for six hours, you are starting from the ones from your great, great grandfather. Eh? You do spiritual mapping. Guy, I give me God forgive us. From the great, great grandfather. And you begin to say according to the name of that person. The effect of the name of that person shall not get into my life. In the name of Jesus Christ. Ah, da, 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 da. There are even those who went ahead and changed their name. Because they thought the person they were named after was a witch. <laughs> Hey, they're like, wait, <laughs> hey, I refuse those manifestations. Let me tell you, do you know there are people who are called wisdom and they are very foolish? <laughs> they are called, uh, and some carry very nice Christian names, but there's no manifestation of the same in their lives. Amen. So we do not live according to our names. We live according to our realities. What I know that I am in Christ. So you can be called uh, who? Munyui, you know. Munyui from my language means somebody who drinks a lot. But you can be that and very Holy Ghost filled and loving. So don't waste your money on lawyers. Bring that money, let's buy land. Amen. Remain with the name you are given. Right now, it has no effect over your life. But if you begin to think it has effect, it will. Okay? If you begin to think that it has effect, it, as a man thinketh, so is he. So if you begin to think, it definitely will. Why? Because you have given the devil material to work with. And he will make that reality become real in your life. Okay? So the Bible is telling us that we do not fight against spiritual, we, we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So you need to come to a place and ask yourself, what is the purpose? What are they doing in the heavenly places? Because you see, okay, for the sake of illustration, you'll allow me to say this. There are two, two realities, okay? And their focus is man. God's focus is, the devil's focus is, so this spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places, their focus is man. And they can never get to man until the man allows them. Okay? So what is it that they do while in the heavenly places? They begin to give you ideas. They begin to throw thoughts into you so that you can come to a place of agreement so that they can begin to have influence over your life. 
So as they are out there, you, it, uh, unless you have allowed them to influence you, and can I tell you, the way they get into us is through our mind. Okay? It's through, it's through our minds. He wants to bring you to a place of agreement. So the Bible is talking about the wiles of the enemy. Okay? The rulers of darkness and spiritual hosts of, of, of weak, uh, wickedness in the heavenly places. So when you're talking about the wiles of the devil, wiles are schemes. Do, not everybody who schemes is powerful. In fact, it's just weak people who scheme so that they can have what they want. Isn't it? It's the weak people, those who do not have access. I don't have to scheme to get to my husband. I already have access. But somebody will scheme because there is what they want, but they don't have access to it. So the devil has schemes so that he can have access to us. Okay? So the Bible is saying that there are schemes, uh, the, the wiles of the enemy. So these wiles are schemes of the enemy with the intention to deceive. Okay? With the intention to deceive. So let's look at this. If, when you look at the word of God in the book of Genesis, there is nothing that the devil could deceive, the end, could deceive Eve with. He could not deceive Eve with money. Gold was plenty. Okay? He could not, he could not, uh, he could not deceive her with infidelity. There was no one to be, <laughs> to cheat with. Okay? And then he could not even get to her based on the past painful experiences. She had just been created. So she did not have a past of painful experiences that the devil could use against them. So there is nothing. Not money, not the past, nothing. Not even infidelity. Because there was nothing. There was no that provision. So what is it that the devil used to, to deceive Eve? She just told her, what you have is not enough. You have it, yes. You have been created by God, but it is not. You still need to go and eat from the truth of, of the of good of the a truth of knowledge. You understand? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? So he just told her, you know what? Eh? You have it, but it is not enough. You need more. And can I tell you, church, this is what the devil has used in our generation. You think Christ is not enough. Many people it is think it is Christ plus something else. It is Christ plus something else. And Paul said, do not allow yourself to be deceived. Do not allow yourself to be defrauded from the simplicity that is in Christ. So many people are being deceived from the end by the enemy because they are thinking this thing about Christ is too simple. I need deep. I need a deeper revelation. You know, I need something deep. And as you're seeking for deep, your grandmother comes up. As you're seeking for deep. Who your grandfather was comes up as you're seeking for. So as you're seeking for deep, we are moving ourselves from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is how God desired, that is how God meant for us to be able to enjoy, to enjoy salvation in simplicity. But many people think Jesus is too simple, but it is as deep as deep can be. Jesus is as deep as deep. He's as deep as deep can be. Let me read this last one as we begin to close. The second closing. Pastor has five. So me, I have how many? <laughs> Ah, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to verse 5, in the TPT. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wait a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God 
and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in the obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose. As soon as you choose, comp uh, yeah, let me see that one. As soon as, 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 soon as, as you choose complete obedience, as soon as you choose complete Obedience. So the Bible is telling us here, we are talking about exercising our authority. I hope you have not removed that from your thoughts, yeah? We are talking about our authority. How do we exercise this authority? This authority that we exercise is against the defenses. What are these things that we hide behind? And let me tell you, there are things that... We, I don't know about the other cultures... But there is a defense that is rising up in my tribe that people are hiding behind. Because we are said this defenses is what people hide behind. They say, oh, I listen, you know, sometimes you want to know, what are these people thinking? They say, you know, uh, everybody has their tradition. Even Jesus had his tradition. So even us, we cannot move from the traditions of our fathers because this is a, is a, is a white man's religion. You know, you know, sometimes you're listening and you feel painful. You feel pain as you listen. This is a white man's religion. I'm thinking, when did it become a white man's religion? Jesus did not die in Britain. Neither was Jesus an American. Jesus did not come from Europe. Jesus came from the Middle East. So it is not a white man's. It must have transversed through another person before it gets to the white man. And the same way it got to the white man, God used the white man to bring it to us. But it is not a white man's. Religion. So there is a defense my tribe has started hiding itself behind. They are saying we have our, even Paul tells us that now we should not be conformed to the traditions of our fathers. So even Paul, as much as he was a Jew, he denied the traditions of his fathers. But this my tribe, they are saying that we have to, to stand, you know, with, with, uh, with, with our cultures, you know. And in that culture, you know what they are saying? That it is okay. You can marry two wives. You, they say, uh, by the way, <laughs> they say, it is okay to beat your wife. It is, she's your wife, not your child. They say, it's okay, you can beat your wife. It is okay, you can marry. Those are the defenses. The people are hiding behind. Are you getting me? Those defenses saying, no, as we are not Jews, as we are Africans. And because we are Africans, we have our traditions. No, Jesus came to deliver us from the traditions of our fathers. Because if those traditions were adding value to us, then Jesus did not need to come. But he came because those traditions were taken away from us. But right now, those traditions have become a defense that people are, fight, are hiding behind. And I am standing here to tell you, if you have been deceived, say, don't do the devil uses deception. If you are a Kikuyu man and you have been deceived, to what they are calling Kiyama, I'm not It's Kiyama for what? I mean, it is, but it is, it is bringing retrogression to educated men. Educated, gone to the university, has a PhD, but how they are behaving, it is what, you see the Bible says, when now they began behaving like that, God gave them over to a debased mind. You are thinking you have a PhD and you are allowing somebody to slaughter a goat and throw their waste on you? 
the waste from the intestines of a goat, hello. How do you then allow that? <laughs> eh? These are the traditions of our fathers that the gospel of Jesus Christ has come to deliver us from. I tell you, you can never serve two. If you are a Christian, remain a Christian. If you choose to go and serve the traditions of your fathers, go and serve the traditions of your fathers and give us time. Let us see how you will end up. Because the devil is not a good master. He is a terrible master. He draws you through deception, not to love you, but to destroy you. It is a reality that is in the Kikuyu people. Oi, allow me to deliver you. It is deception. It is a defense that the devil is trying to hide the Kikuyu so so community behind. And it is not of God. I stand here to say it is not of God. It is not. And with time you shall be destroyed. He's going to destroy you. It's not God who is going to judge you. No, it is the one that you have allowed to draw you. That is going to destroy you. Because the devil draws you to destroy you. He separates you to destroy you. So Kikuyu men, I don't know what is happening in other cultures, but that is the one I'm exposed to. So if I knew what was happening in Luyad, I would have mentioned, but I don't know. But I'm talking about what I, what I have seen. So do not hide. Do not use your traditions as a defense. We were delivered from the traditions of our fathers. We have been delivered from the traditions of our fathers. And you cannot exercise authority. And today you are in Kiama Kiama. And then tomorrow your child is sick and you are saying, I rebuke you. How? How? You cannot have two. Okay, we don't have altars, but you cannot serve two. Are you understanding? You have to make a choice to serve. You have to make to, uh, a choice to serve one. And the Bible is saying that the other reality... The word of God does is to, to uh, the word of God helps us to demolish every deceptive fantasy, okay, that opposes God. So the purpose of this fantasy is to oppose God, is to oppose the word of God. But when you get to understand that, you exercise your, you exercise your authority. I don't think I want to stay there because I really need to conclude in that with that amen so we are talking about authority so there are various ways that we exercise authority and i'm gonna give you uh, i'm gonna give you just one example in the book of john chapter 14 verse 12 to verse 14 the bible says most assuredly i say to you he who believes in me the works that i do he will do also and greater works than this will he do because i go to my father and whatever you ask in my name that i will do that the father may be glorified in the sun if you ask anything in my name i will do it so if you look at this in the greek it is in essence it is uh, you demanding your rights not asking god to do something it's you demanding your rights i say he who was that i do will do greater works and this will do if i go and whatever you ask so you can ask for a situation to change you address that situation and you ask that situation to change are you getting me? So if you look at this in the Greek, it talks about demanding your rights. Demanding your rights here on the earth. When you see a situation is not working to your favor, you can demand it to change. And the Bible says, because you're asking that in the name of Jesus, God will make sure it becomes a reality in your life. So you demand things to change. Amen. So there are things that we ask God that God is like, please don't ask me address that situation are you understanding address that situation Cross the whole agenda.
agenda of me being crucified with Christ was to eradicate that old person that was incompatible with God. That man was killed on the cross. The reality of the fact in Christianity is we are born of the Spirit, but we are discipled by the Word. Understand that there is a capacity that is called the nature of God that is in you.